introduce you to Mary Jemison. Mary? Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, when Amy coming through, excuse me. Oh, right. yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. You just give me time and I'll get there. I'll get there. Yes, sir. Oh my goodness, I think we should have a party. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, folks, hello there. Hello. Good to see you. First thing I want to tell you, I was 91 when I died in September 19, 1833. September 19. Hundred and eighty years I've been dead. Party! <laughs> <laughs> well, you know about me, Mary Jemison. You've probably been down to Letchworth Park. Mm -hmm. yes? Mm -hmm. yes? And you've seen that statue of me there. Mm -hmm. And that's over my grave. Yes, and not too far away, there's a cabin that I helped my daughter Nancy build. It wasn't my home, it was close to my home, but that was my daughter Nancy's and I helped build it. Yes, why well, you know. And I saw it on the sign out front. I'm the white woman of the Genesee. Yes, sir. I was born white. Lived most of my life as a Seneca. Yes. And it's been a pretty unusual life was starting right when I was born. I wasn't born at home. You folks, some of you were born in a hospital. I wasn't. I was born someplace out in the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> now Thomas Jemison, his very pregnant wife Jane Irwin, Two boys, John and Thomas, and a daughter, Betsy, were on shipboard. And they were sailing from Northern Ireland, headed down for the port of Philadelphia. April 1742 or 43, Tada Mary joined the family. And when the Jemisons got to Philadelphia, Thomas took us all west in Pennsylvania to an area that was called Marsh Creek. And, uh, oh, I know you, you probably never heard of Marsh Creek, but about eight, ten miles east of that, there's a place called Gettysburg uh, in Adams County. Well, our life there at Marsh Creek colonial life, about what you'd expect it to be, clearing the land and building and planting and, and two more boys joined the family, Robert and Matthew. And so life went on pretty good, pretty nice, just hard, hard life, good life, surviving until I was about 12 years old, maybe 15, probably 15, when my white life just, just changed completely. And that's when a party of marauding Shawnee Indians and Frenchmen, they came through our part of Pennsylvania and they were killing the settlers and they were burning the farms and they took my family and the neighbor families and they marched us away from our homes too and we left our burning homes behind us. Oh, they marched us hard and fast. There were children, little children, and they wouldn't let us stop to rest. They wouldn't give us water to drink. But no, it was hard. And about a day or two away from our homes, one Indian took me and he sat me down and he took off my shoes and my socks and he put moccasins on my feet. And if you think I was happy about that, well, you would be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but my mother, she took me aside and she said, Mary, Mary, no, don't fight them. Don't fight them. 
go along with what they say, then maybe, maybe, maybe it'll be all right. But no matter what happens, my darling daughter, I want you to remember three things. You remember who your father and mother are. Thomas and Jane Jemison. And two, you remember the prayers that we taught you growing up. And three, you can speak English. My mother, she was right. A little neighbor boy and I were taken and marched away from our families. He never saw them again. But I know, I know they were killed because when we got to where they were taking us in Fort Duquesne, and that's Pittsburgh to you folks. There I saw some scalps, and one I know was my mother's hair and my father's hair. Well, at Fort Duquesne, those Indians, they took me and they gave me to two Seneca sisters. And those Seneca sisters wanted a replacement for their brother who had been killed by the hands of the whites. And so these two sisters, they took me and they put me in a boat with them. And we went down the Ohio River, river to the Ohio settlement of Seneca's where they lived. And when we got there, well, it was hard for me but you have to survive, so you learn the language. You eat the food. You do the chores you're given. You wear the clothes you're given. You survive, and life was pretty good. And one couple years, I married. Handsome, Delaware, not a chief, just, just a warrior. Yes. And with him, I had two children. The first, again, sad. A little girl only lived a day or two after she was born, so she doesn't have a name. About a year later, though, I had a son, a oh, beautiful son, and I named him Thomas in honor of my father. And when Thomas was about nine months old, my Seneca sisters had moved up to Western New York. And I wanted to go see them, because I, I had learned to love them. They were my family now. So I said to my husband, please, take me up to Western New York. And he said, well, I can't go right now, but I'll join you in the, in the spring. But take a couple of your Seneca brothers, and you can go up and see your sisters, your family. So I put Thomas on my back. By canoe, some, but mostly. <laughs> Four or five hundred miles. Ended up in a place called Caniadia. <laughs> Seneca settlement. Caniadia is a Seneca word. It means where the heavens rest upon the earth. Yes, and that Seneca town, Canadia, is on a river called Genesee, mm -hmm. which means pleasant banks, Seneca River. Well, we hadn't been there very long. Sadness again, I heard, got word that my husband, my handsome husband, had died and been killed. Well, I didn't have family, particularly at that point, in Canyon Dia. So I packed up, put Thomas on my back again, and I started off for a place called Little Beardstown. Well, it's Kylerville to you modern folks. Kylerville, that's near Leicester, not too far from Geneseo. And, uh, oh, by the way, that statue you see of me in Lutchwood Park, that's me going from Ohio Settlement, Canadia, Thomas, Canadia, to Little Bear's Time, Thomas, on my back. Well, 
The sisters were glad to see me. I was glad to see them. And I settled in. There wasn't any point to go back to the Ohio settlement. Mm -hmm. I had my family, mm -hmm. my sisters. Mm -hmm. This was home. So I stayed when I was 25. Happiness again. I married again. Seneca. Chief! Not <laughs> Chief! <laughs> Well, yes, I have to say that, and I'm real proud of that. I think he was 40 years older than I am. Oh, <laughs> but he was a good husband to me and a good father to the children. Now, I can't say what he was like when he went away to fight the British, or I mean the, the Americans, because he did. And I didn't hear good things he Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, with with my Seneca chief, I had six children, two boys and four girls. I'd like to tell you just a little bit about them. Firstborn was a boy. I named him John, my brother. Nancy, Betsy, Irish sister. Polly, Jane, mother, last four, Jesse, and just a little bit more. Oh, by the way, of course they had Seneca names. I did too, but you understand English, so. <laughs> now, Nancy and Betsy, when they were old enough, they married two Senecas with the last name of Green or Green Blanket, and they had many, many children. Polly married the son of Chief Shango, who was a prominent chief in the Canadia settlement, and we got a Shango road and up near mm -hmm. well there's Shango again. Oh. Him. Yeah, yeah, him. Chief. And they had many children. And then I'm going to stick to John, married a couple of women from the Shangold line, and he had many children. Jane died when she was about 15 or 16, didn't marry. And Jesse, my last born son, he never married. He was kind of special. He was, I hate to say a mama's boy, but. <laughs> so, now that's my family. Back to the history timeline. You called it the American Revolution. I know, you learned Concord, Lexington, 1775. That's Washington. Didn't matter much to us there at Little Beardstown until 1779. And then what a difference it made because that awful General John <coughs> Sullivan came through with a Continental Army and they were going through our part of Western New York and their intention was to destroy the Iroquois Confederacy. And of course the Senecas are one of the tribes of the Iroquois Confederacy and oh, when we knew they were coming after the beginning, we heard word that how awful because they'd come into a village and, and anybody that stayed in the village, they killed old men, old women, babies, children. They were to kill. And those they didn't kill, they intended would die because they burned the homes, destroyed the burn, all of the homes, they burned the crops, they even burned the orchards and they slayed all of the animals. There was not a thing left to eat to keep a person alive. Many of the Senecas went up to Fort Niagara where the British would protect them and help them. But I, I, I took my family and we hid a long time in the woods. But after we knew it was safe, we came back and we settled in a place called Gardo Flats. That's the way far north park of Letchworth Park, way down beyond Lower Falls, Guard Old Flats, down close to where they have the festival, you know, in October. Well, we settled there, and we stayed for about 50 years. 50 years of living. And that's pretty good. 
and the pretty good also is after the Revolutionary War was over and the big treaty treaty of 1797, and that's at Geneseo, was signed. Take a look. I became a landowner. They gave me, gave me about 17,000 acres. Well, no, that's not right. It's really closer to 18,000 because it was 17,000 297 acres, yes, ma'am. I bet there's not a farmer in this room or a person who lives on a farm that goes into the towns. Anybody? Raise your hand. I don't think so. Eight. <laughs> but on the bad side, have to tell you some bad things. In those 50 years, the first is that my husband, the son of the chief, died. 102, three years old. Oh, tuberculosis. Sad, appropriate. The next. This is hard for me to tell you what next I have to. It's about my boys. John, firstborn second husband, he had a vile, vile temper. And when you put that with alcohol, a monster, a monster. And this monster son of mine, John, got in an argument with his half-brother, Thomas, my first, firstborn son. And in the course of that argument, John took a tomahawk and buried it in Thomas's brain, killing it. Thomas was only 52 years old. Wait, more. Short time later, Monster John argued with his own brother, Jesse. Knife, 17, 18, stab. Jesse died 26, 27, two sons gone and three. Three, four years later, Monster John had a drunken brawl. This time, he was killed. My son's gone. No mother should outlive her children. Oh, dear. Well, jumping ahead, really big thing when I was 81 years old, 1823. Excuse me. 1823. There was a man, a literate man, that lived in Genesee County, Pembroke. He was a doctor. He came over to Whaley's Tavern, which is just north of. Castile. There's a sign in the cornfield when you go there. It says Whaley's Cabin close to. And I, he waited there at the tavern, and I walked the old four or five miles from our guard old flats home. And I sat down with Mr. Seaver, Mr. James Seaver, and in English, I told him all about my life. White Seneca. And he wrote it down. And the next year, a book came out, and most of what you folks know about me is this book. You might say the narrative of Mary Jemison or the life of Mary Jemison. I was 81 years when I told them I tried to be accurate, and there have been many editions. You want to know about me? <laughs> well, that was wonderful because. I'm still alive because of that book, I think. <laughs> and then, 81 years old, getting close to, I knew, hard thing, but a good thing, I sold most of my land in the beautiful Genesee Valley. And I took much of my family from 
away from home and went to our new home at Buffalo Creek. That's South Buffalo. Uh, <laughs> and that's where I spent my last years. And I was on my deathbed, I knew, folks know, and a Christian miss missionary, and this, Mrs. Wright came to me and said, do you want me to pray with you? And she started, our Father, who art in heaven. I said, There, in the Buffalo Creek, but I died knowing I had fulfilled a promise to my mother. My parents taught me the Lord's Prayer in English. When I died, I was buried there, Buffalo Creek Little Cemetery. But wait, that's not here. How did I get? <laughs> <laughs> Thomas's son, called Buffalo Tom, who was uh, quite an active figure, went to Mr. Pryor, William Pryor Electric. Oh, I know you've heard about him. And they talked, and because of Mr. Pryor, William Pryor Electric's position and his ability, he had my bones dug up from Buffalo Creek and brought down and reinterred on that little knoll up behind the museum where they are now. That was 1874. And then well, there was a base. 1910, Mr. Letchworth hired a sculptor to do a statue of me. 1910. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, me, and soon after that, by the way, Mr. Letchworth died after 1910, shortly after. <laughs> 1928, the foundation had that fence you put around, and it's what you see when you pull that out. Well, I told you my life was unusual. Ocean, stolen. <laughs> Good life, respected number. Me, little Barry Jemison. Me, I wasn't even five foot tall, and yet I did all of that. I was about four and a half feet tall. Me, when in my younger days, with my chestnut colored hair, I know, my chestnut bed, blue eyes, fair skin, sister, daughter, mother, wife, grandmother, oh man. And I says, I said, it's been 180 years since I died. And you beautiful people, you keep me alive. And so I say to you, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Ninety-one. You have to know there's a little difference about because it's 1742 or 43. It was probably about 90. I say 91 rather than 90 because it's. <laughs> 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 it deserves it. Oh, oh, it was. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we're going to go into the second part of our presentation right now, and we're going to show you some slides of Letchworth Park. How many have been up to the Mary Jemison? Okay, most of the room. Great. Okay, well, just to remind you, we're going to show you some pictures of the uh, uh, Mary Jemison statuary um, before it was painted. It was painted in the last few years, painted black. And uh, some of the, and the, her uh, cabin is right beside the statue. And so we'll go, uh, let's see, can we have the, with the door? So we leave it, uh, we close the door and the church can get a little, yep, yeah. on the floor. Okay, okay, this is, a, this is a statue of Mary, and uh, if you go walk around the statue, of course you see the, uh, the baby on her back, and uh, the baby Thomas. <coughs> 
And down at the base of this is uh, our uh, remainders as they were uh, exhumed and transferred back to Ledgewood. So Mary Jemison there. Okay. Okay, this is the mighty Genesee, which uh, Kay and I live beside. And uh, this is what, uh, what Mary would have, she would have uh, probably come up uh, the Allegheny, but gotten onto the Genesee. She certainly got onto the Genesee River before uh, she went to Canadia. Okay. And there's the uh, Genesee in the uh, in spring, summer, and it's the local winter. Now, um, the sign wasn't there, of course. <laughs> uh, just for your reference, what does Canadia mean in Seneca? Where the heavens meet or rest on the earth. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's Genesee mean? Pleasant Banks. Pleasant Banks, right. And ultimately, she, she did not spend long in Canada, but ultimately she would be in Lunchworth Park. Of course, the bridge wasn't there. But, uh, some dramatic things are happening today that the bridge is going to essentially be replaced. And uh, again, for another view of her statue at Lunchworth. And this is the um, this is the plaque um, on the statue. It says to the memory of Mary Jemison, who was home during more than 70 years of a life of strange vicissitude. I love that word, uh, but that has to do with changes. Was among the Senecas upon the banks of this river, and whose history um, inseparably. Can you read? Is that connected with that of this valley has? Can you read that one? Caused, caused her to be known as the Genesee, right? Okay. This is the uh, cabin that uh, she and her daughter built, and it's there uh, right beside the, uh, the statuary of Nashworth. Now, was that built right there? No. No, it was probably built on the Gardo Flats and moved up there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is uh, the council house, and this was in Canadia. And um, this, was, uh, this was falling apart. William Pryor Letchworth heard about it, went to see it, and um, had it moved and rebuilt at Letchworth Park. And so. It was uh, on Council House Road. Um, Council House Road is right off Route 19 as you go from Canada to Hope. And it's uh, on the right. And by the way, it's worth a trip. Uh, you go down a couple miles and uh, there's some more uh, monuments and so forth. And I'm going to tie that with something because can you go back to the, the cabin of the Council House again? Uh, we're going to take just a little sidestep and talk about somebody else who was in Canada and somebody else who was honored at Letchworth Park, and that's Moses Van Campen. And Moses Van Campen was essentially an Indian fighter. He had seen his father and his brother murdered by the Senecas, and he had gotten away, and he spent most of the rest of his uh, experience in the Revolutionary War fighting against uh, um, the Iroquois. And he was captured at one point by the Senecas and brought here and um, in Canada, in front of this council house, and he was made to run the gauntlet. Uh, the Senecas didn't know whom they had captured. Um, if they had, they would have executed him. But he, uh, he didn't uh, say anything about it, and nobody recognized him. But what they did is they bound him and made him run between two lines of, uh, of Senecas who were armed with war clubs and tomahawks and knives and so forth. And um, he, uh, he was a pretty sharp guy. What he did was he ran so close to one side of the line of Indians that he uh, crowded their blows. And he was far enough from the other side that they couldn't reach him. And then towards the end, he saw two squaws down at the end of the line, and he jumped in the air and he kicked each of them aside. The uh, Senecas were so uh, amused by this, that they uh, they decided not to execute him. So they sent him up to Fort Niagara to be imprisoned. And um, when, a little later, some other Senecas came and said, "You had Moses Van Campen, and you let him get away." And, uh, so they went after him. But by this time, the British had him up in Fort Niagara, and he eventually would escape. 
he would come back to this area and he would uh, become a surveyor for Philip Church and the uh, early settlers of Allegheny County. His home is in Angelica. He did live in Elmond at one time, but his uh, brick home is in Angelica. It's up from the cemetery. It's owned by Bill Hart, who has a jewelry store in Wildo. And it's a beautiful home, uh, and it's all brick, and that's where Moses Van Camp, he had that built, and that's where he lived. He would eventually, I think, die in maybe Hornell. 